feature speaker today is Jim Bolognese, Senior, Vital Senior Director, Strategic Consulting. Jim, please go ahead. Thanks, Rick. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining. Uh, this talk is about speeding early development using computer simulation and biomarkers. It involves a sequence of three trials, uh, a proof of concept trial with the biomarker followed by a dose finding trial with the biomarker, and then a third trial, uh, a phase to B trial with a clinical endpoint. And the purpose is to choose the correct dose for phase three. Uh, this is joint work with two of my Seinfeld colleagues, J.D. Benditon, listed here, and a multidisciplinary staff for the client with whom we worked on this project, uh, a group at Merck. Uh, this is just a background on me. Um, I'm at Cytel. I've been here four years. Uh, before that, I was a statistician at MERS, uh, and I've worked before on, on adaptive designs um, and, and all phases of drug development. And for those of you who know me, I'm certainly not dressed like that on the picture at this time. The outline of the talk today is to start with uh, motivation for this work, and then some background and uh, an overview. Uh, I'll talk then about the particular development scenario that uh, this work applied to, then move to an overview of the modeling, talk about the cases that were simulated, show you some selected results, and then sum up the conclusions. The sponsor was preparing an early development plan and had these questions in mind. How could they use the relationship between early biomarkers and the clinical endpoints to optimize their early phase development program? Um, in particular, looking at improving the quality of the information and or the speed of, of the development program. Uh, associated with this is how to how could different designs, the consideration of different designs in phase one, uh, namely the proof of concept design and the dose finding biomarker design, how could those different designs improve uh, the design of the phase two B trial? And how could they use the phase one data to optimize dose selection for that phase two trial? Um, would the use of that information allow reducing the phase two sample size uh, or improve the chance of picking the right dose in phase three or for phase three. So here's a schematic of their initial thoughts on the development program. They started with a biomarker POC trial uh, on the left, and, and that was high dose versus placebo. And then there were some go-no-go -no -go criteria based on a Bayesian uh, analysis of the data to compute posterior probability of response for two biomarkers that they were considering using. Uh, and then if there's a go decision, they go to the biomarker dose finding trial and they would add some doses um, and, and, and get biomarker information. And then there was the same go-no-go -go criteria. Uh, so if there's a go, then, then they move to the phase 2B trial with the clinical endpoint uh, and leverage that information from, the, from a combined analysis of the first two trials to help design that phase 2 trial with the clinical endpoint. And then uh, there's the same go-no-go -go criteria uh, to phase 3 and a phase 3 dose choice. So the key objective is to um, design that phase 2B trial to maximize the probability of getting the phase 3 dose right. What we did uh, to address the questions that were posed at the beginning of the talk was to use the, the pre-validated biomarkers and the prior data available to build uh, relationship models of the biomarker to the clinical endpoint and model their time course. 
Uh, we then um, made our best guess as to the true values underlying that would yield a uh, clinically important response, and then simulated design options for the sequence of trials applying the go-no-go -no -go criteria. Then we summarized the results and produced a recommended development program that was actually better than, than what was originally planned. And we'll describe how that worked out later. What we learned from this exercise was that simulating the, a sequence of trials is useful um, in designing an early development program. Um, we learned that in this case, biomarkers were useful for demonstration of proof of concept, but of only limited use for dose finding. Uh, and that finding allowed us to eliminate an entire uh, biomarker dose finding trial from the critical path of development. And the resulting plan achieved an earlier start to the phase 2B trial. So now I'll move to just an overview of what clinical trial simulation uh, involves and, and then program simulation and, and then the, the remainder of the topic. Um, in, in clinical trial simulation, we define some true underlying scenarios or endpoints and different study designs and different decision rules. And then we generate many repetitions of the data through computer simulation and then we summarize the results, compare them across the scenarios and the possible choices, and choose and justify a trial design by those simulations. And they, those simulations demonstrate the performance characteristics of the designs across a span of potential true scenarios. And this is widely used in drug development to design individual trials. What's new is drug, what's newer is drug program simulation. In drug program simulation, you design a sequence, one designs a sequence of clinical trial simulations and decision rules for moving from one trial to the next. And the aim is to optimize that sequence of trials for a particular set of drug program objectives. There is a body of prior work on simulating sequences of clinical trials, uh, and they were targeted to the sequence of trials from phase two dose finding to phase three, and then um, uh, evaluating the impact of those designs and different design choices on the probability of program success, namely two trials yielding significant difference from control, and uh, the impact on product net present value. Uh, the references to those works are, are listed here, uh, and part of that was a, a DIA adaptive program working group um, in, in which I participated as a co-author on one of those papers. What's new is uh, applying this, uh, what we think is new, is applying this program simulation to the early development space, and in particular, optimizing the use of biomarkers. So what that involved in this case is to consider short-term, small sample size biomarker trials to optimize the phase two design, which is based on the clinical endpoint. And the aim is to optimize that design with regard to selection of the doses to include in that phase to be trial and optimize its sample size. The aim is to improve the probability of selecting the correct dose for phase three. Um, and in particular, to answer the sponsor's questions, which we posed at the beginning of, of this presentation. So here's a little bit lower drill down and on, on, on what we did. Um, as mentioned, we want to optimize the biomarker phase one to phase two B space uh, and program to improve the probability of selecting the 
correct phase three dose. So that program started with a TOC high dose versus placebo biomarker trial. And then if certain criteria were met, moved to a biomarker dose finding trial, which added information of a low and a mid dose, um, again with placebo control. And then after completion of those two biomarker trials, we perform a pooled analysis of the combined information to get a dose response profile of the biomarker, leverage the relationship of those biomarkers to the clinical endpoint, which we haven't measured yet at the appropriate time point, um, but predict what the biomarker tells us about that endpoint and then use that information to pick the doses um, to, to include in a phase 2 B trial, and then we use those doses in a phase 2 B trial, simulate the results from the, the assumed true underlying uh, dose response relationship of the clinical endpoint uh, to response, uh, and then look at those data and pick the right, and pick a dose for phase 3, and compare that to what the true uh, dose should have been. And that lets us know how good this program is doing. So this is the same schematic that's shown before, but there's an additional um, additional item. Uh, namely, if the results of the biomarker POC trial are highly robust, uh, namely a, 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 a much larger posterior probability for biomarker response, then we have an option to skip the biomarker dose finding trial and move directly to the phase 2B trial. Now we don't have dose response information, so we have some pre-selected doses. So the aim here is to compare this rapid to 2B approach with the availability of the biomarker dose response information and leveraging that to see how useful that dose response information of the biomarker is in helping design that phase 2B trial. And again, the, the key questions are, are we making the right decisions to stop or go along the path? And if we go, do we get the phase 3 dose right? And, and how much of the time does that occur? So we compare this option uh, for rapid to be with the original uh, proposed sequence of trials. Here's the particular set of biomarker to fate clinical endpoint response relationship that we use and the true underlying dose response curves that we use. Each of the biomarkers has the same Emax model um, with the values of the Emax model parameters listed here. Uh, for those of you familiar with an Emax model, there are four parameters. We always assume the slope is one. The Emax response was standardized to one, and, and the ED50 was 20 milligrams. Um, the same ED50 was assumed for the clinical response endpoint, but with a lower Emax value. The variance covariance matrix for the um, ED50s is shown at, at the top there in the upper right. Um, and so we assume the point in correlation of the response for the uh, biomarkers, but only a modest correlation with the clinical endpoint. And that was based on prior information. Then, because we are measuring the clinical endpoint at two different times um, and, and the biomarker information at two different times, um, we have an exponential time course factor that's included in the model. Uh, and we have a finite uh, set of doses. There's a typo on this slide. The 25 should be a 20 um, because uh, um, oh, no, that's not right. It was 25. Um, the, the ED50 was 20. So we have this finite set of doses 
And the target level of response is about 80% of the maximum, and that's an 0.4 level for the clinical endpoint. And the true, the, the dose that yields that, so the true target dose is, is the 100 milligram dose. And the phase 1B, uh, the, the phase 1 program, um, the high dose was 1,000, and the mid and low doses were 500 and 250. So the phase 1 trial used 20, a sample size of 20 uh, individuals versus 10 for placebo. Uh, and then applied the, the go no go rules based on the Bayesian posterior distribution of the responses from that trial. Uh, and then it go proceeded to the second biomarker trial, which added 20 response observations at the mid and low dose, uh, and then 10 more on placebo applied the go no go rules. And then there was a combined analysis to estimate the posterior distribution of the Emacs model parameters if we follow the path that went through the second trial. And then that data was used to choose doses for the third trial, which was the 2B clinical endpoint trial. And there were a complicated set of dose choice uh, Algorithm. There was a complicated algorithm for dose choices, which yielded either three or four doses, and we studied uh, three sample sizes for the uh, clinical endpoint trial uh, in 2B. And then after that result, we chose the phase three dose based on the posterior distribution of the clinical endpoint uh, model fit at the end of the uh, the phase 2B trial. Uh, this is, we assume a linear relationship between the biomarker um, and the biomarkers and the, the clinical endpoint response, which was a 12-week uh, response. Um, when we, we had two time, two durations uh, of, the, of the phase 1 trial that we considered, uh, a rapid response in which we couldn't measure the clinical endpoint, which is denoted as biomarker 3. Um, and we had a four-week uh, option for that trial in which we could get an early, an early uh, outcome for the clinical endpoint, namely the biomarker 3. Um, so the aim was to compare whether it was worth doing a longer-term phase 1B trial to get an early lead on the clinical endpoint and see if that would be useful in, in the dose selection process for phase 2B. Uh, we used uh, the information then from this linear model, which uh, was based on, was derived based on information from previous studies, and, and used that to predict the 12-week response. And, and then uh, that predictive response is used to uh, pick the doses for phase 2B. So this complicated schematic uh, summarizes the software that was built. Uh, we had the Bayesian, machine, the Bayesian model machinery, but we didn't have the um, software to, to, to apply it to a sequence of trials. So just following through this, we start with the POC user inputs. Uh, we use those to execute the simulation engine uh, and yield the POC trial output, apply go, no, go criteria. If it is go decision, then we pull in the phase 1B uh, design inputs and um, sim simulate the uh, phase 2 information. I'm oh, sorry, the, the 1B dose binding information, 
unless there's a rapid fit to 2B uh, uh, result, and then we go directly to 2B. But if not, we get that dose finding. Uh, we, we go to the dose finding trial, run that simulation engine, and yield the uh, dose finding results added to the POC results. Um, and, and then we apply the go-no-go -no -go criteria to go to phase 2B or not. Uh, and if we go to phase 2B, then there's a similar structure for the phase 2B clinical endpoint. We get that output, and we select the phase 3 doses and compare it to the truth. And that's the, um, that, 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 that's, that's the key information we're looking for. So these are the factors that we sought to compare. We had that two-day duration uh, for the POC trial and the, the, the biomarker dose finding trial. Uh, and then we had the four-week duration in which we could add the early read on the clinical endpoint. And, and then we had the three sample sizes for the phase 2D trial uh, and the low, mid, high dose. Uh, or, or maybe we added another low dose uh, under certain criteria. Uh, then other elements of the simulation were that we had two different prior distributions that were considered. Um, there's an uninformative prior if we had the two-day duration option for the early phase trials, um, and we have an informative uh, prior if, if, we, if we get the early biomarker result uh, from the four-week uh, phase 1B trials. Uh, we have this uh, fourth sequence of trial options that goes from POC to phase 1B dose finding of biomarkers and then to phase 2B, and we have this option for the rapid to phase 2B uh, option, skipping the phase 1B dose finding biomarker trial. Um, so, so that rapid to 2B option is um, uh, confounded with the uninformative prior, and the fourth sequence option is where we evaluated the informative prior because we needed that uh, phase 1B dose finding information to evaluate that. And then the key metric that I'm going to show you, there were some other metrics that were actually summarized, but the key metric is the uh, rate of choosing the correct phase three dose, and, and that's just computed from the proportion of simulations in which we got the phase three dose right. This slide summarizes the findings. Uh, we found that uh, two days is sufficient for making the go-no-go -no -go decision. There was no added benefit of the second uh, biomarker dose-finding trial. Uh, the next question is, uh, could we use the phase 1B results for dose selection? And the results yielded the conclusion that uh, the relationships between the biomarkers were too variable to drive the dose-finding decision-making. And the informative prior didn't help much at improving the probability of getting the phase three dose right. So that the optimal design was uh, a fixed design for 2B with 100 sample size, maybe more, um, because when we looked at that fixed sample size, it yielded limited ability to discriminate between active doses and didn't have high probability of getting the phase 3 dose right. So we offered the consideration that a larger phase 2B trial is needed um, to uh, have high probability of getting the phase 3 dose right. And I'll show you some of those results in the next few slides. This slide summarizes the two-day versus four-week option. Um, in the case where we apply the uh, the uninformative prior for the two-day option and the informative prior uh, for, for the four-week option. And we summarize the percent of simulations that are, the top row is at the target dose and the second row is near. This near is a, is a typo, this is at. Um, and then the percent where we got an estimated dose but it wasn't near. Near means adjacent to, 
And, and then there's a percentage simulation where there, we, we couldn't get any estimated target dose. That is, the EMAX model fit was lower than the target of 0.4. So as you can see, the percents uh, are, are within the simulation error. Um, we simulated 500 simulations, uh, and we chose 500 because simulating a sequence of trials and doing the Bayesian analysis after each one runs a very long time. Um, so, so we ran 500 simulations, and, and the result was that um, there was no advantage of the informative prior on the four-week duration over the two-day the two -day option. In the next slide, um, we look at whether the uh, informative prior and four-week option with a smaller sample size in phase 2B could match uh, uh, the short-term phase 1B option um, with the, the, the potential to rapidly go to 2B with that option and a larger phase 2B. And you can see just modest improvement in the percent of simulations at the target dose and a decrease in the, uh, the, 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 the percent of simulations that yielded no target dose. Um, so this uh, larger sample size, the, the informative prior and smaller phase 2B sample size was not an option that, that was as good as, as the, the, the rapid to 2B with large sample size option. Now, the results of the previous slide are copied into the first and fourth columns. And what we add here is what if we do a full-size uh, 100 patient phase 2B trial and use the sequence of trials and the informative prior? Um, is that informative prior with the same sample size at phase 2 uh, buying us anything? And in this case, the answer is not much. Um, you get a similar, generally similar uh, performance characteristics with the two-day phase one and phase one trials as you do with the four-week trial where you measure the clinical endpoint and use an informative prior. Um, so this is the key information that um, supports the rapid to 2B option because there's not much gain in getting that phase 1B dose finding information. Um, but you also notice that the total number of simulations that yield a predicted phase 3 dose at or near the target is only around 15% or more. And so that means the question of how big does phase 2B need to be to, 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 to increase that probability of getting the phase 3 dose right. And that's what's shown on the following slide. Um, we, to run with increased sample size, uh, we ran those with lowering the variance and yielding an effective sample size increase uh, because we wanted to cut down on the runtime. Um, but with the lower variances to yield increased effective phase 2B sample size, uh, we find that you get high probability of getting the dose right with about 150, a little less than 150 patients per dose in the phase 2B. And that's more than you need to discriminate drug from placebo in phase 2B. Um, at the bottom of the slide are sample sizes for 80% power uh, and, and detectable differences uh, from control. And um, the sample size of 100, which was used in the, sim the earlier simulations, has 80% power to detect the target response, 0.4, uh, but the analysis, the simulation set above it, you know, that's based on high probability of getting at or near the target, um, 
it detects a smaller, that has a power to detect a smaller difference. So what we learned from this exercise is that biomarkers that in this situation were useful for proof of concept, but not for clinical endpoint dose finding. Uh, from an efficacy dose selection point of view, the fastest path, development path, uh, for this situation should be to move to the phase 2B trial right after the early proof of concept trial based on the biomarker. And, and that's the short term trial. Uh, the dose finding profile from the POC plus dose finding phase 1 information would not materially impact on the phase 3 dose choice. So the phase 1, the dose finding trial could be skipped, and that uh, could result in substantial savings of resource and time. Or the phase 1B trial, uh, the phase 1B dose finding trial could remain in the program and be conducted concurrently with the phase 2B trial um, and repurposed for other objectives like testing another dose re regimen or, or getting dose response information on mechanism of action um, outcomes. In the context of overall drug development, um, if you consider a sequence of trial for an overall drug development program of biomarker proof of concept followed by biomarker dose finding, followed by phase two dose finding with the clinical endpoint, and then phase three based on the clinical endpoint, and resulting in uh, probability of success or NPV, uh, net present value of drugs, um, you could consider optimizing that drug program and then doing that for multiple drug programs and then optimizing the portfolio. The previous work um, that I talked about earlier focused on this phase two, phase three, and uh, program POS and NPV space. And then there are references in the reference list with these slides that are being made available that deal with optimizing resource allocation across a portfolio of drugs uh, based on POS and net present value of drugs. Uh, but we know of no work that links the phase one biomarker space to the phase two clinical outcome space, a clinical endpoint space, and that's what this work adds to um, the development program. So now there are references and um, software available to um, optimize the early development space, optimize the late development space, uh, and, and optimize across, uh, optimize resource allocation across portfolio. In conclusion, um, we learned that simulating a sequence of trials is useful in the early drug development space. That was shown by the previous work in the late development space, and now it is useful again. It is useful also in the early development space. In this particular example, biomarkers are useful for POC, but they be of only limited use for dose finding. Um, each development program is different. This applies only to one example, so it may be different with other biomarkers and other development programs. Um, still to consider to improve the use of biomarkers are to assess the impact of PKPD relationship information, or employ instead of a linear relationship model, some sort of more complicated mechanistic model that might do a better job of relating the biomarker response to the clinical endpoint. Um, we didn't have information like that for this case, but if we get it, we might be able to apply it, and we might learn something different, and biomarkers may be uh, found useful in those situations. 
Uh, early development simulation could be added to late development program simulation to optimize across an entire drug development program. Uh, and uh, already optimized development plans using approaches like these could um, be used across a portfolio and combined with portfolio optimization uh, to assist senior management with resource allocation across their drug portfolio. The business benefit, the potential business benefit of all of this is um, for the particular case we worked on to eliminate a clinical trial from the critical path of an early development program, which uh, could result in cost and time savings. And we've obtained software and experience which could be leveraged for other drug development projects. The reference list uh, is shown on this last slide. Um, it will be available in the slide set that will be made available on the web and, and uh, to those who request it directly. Um, I won't read through it at this time, but it's part of part of the slide set that, that goes with the presentation. So with that, I thank everyone for your attention, and we could move to some consideration of questions, comments, and any discussion. And hi, this is Mike White. I'm the Director of Marketing here at Cytel, and I'll serve as a moderator, if you will, for uh, Jim, and we see a, a number of questions that have already uh, come in from the audience. Um, so we'll be selecting those, and please feel free to uh, to pose more questions, and we'll get to uh, as many of them as, as we can. Um, before we get uh, started with the question and answer period, I just want to remind everybody at the conclusion of the, of the uh, question and answer period, when the WebEx ends, you'll be directed automatically to a very short survey, but uh, we really hope that everyone takes just a few minutes to complete the survey. It won't take more than a few minutes, but it really helps us to understand how we perform today and the information that you'll be looking for in the future that would be helpful uh, from Cytel. Also, just to remind everyone, as you've probably seen through the question and answer uh, responses, today's slides are available immediately. Um, in um, PDF form from just simply go to sitefelt.com and you'll follow the links on the bottom right um, that reference today's webinar. And then uh, in 24, 24 to 48 hours, certainly by Thursday, the replay, the WebEx replay of today's uh, presentation will also be available for anyone to view at their convenience. All right, Jim, um, a number of good questions have come in. Um, I'll start uh, with a question that uh, is, is often uh, asked. Um, can you tell us, give us a little insight about how long it took to complete this particular work with, work with Merck uh, and how long it took really to implement, successfully implement uh, the technique? Um, yeah, um, actually, um, the work started last spring, uh, and we had to present a report to the client um, by September. Um, so from the start of definition of the project, program specification, completion of the programming, running the simulations, writing the report and summarizing the results, iterating several times with the client, um, and producing the final report of this, you know, roughly half a year. But now, having gone through that, um, the next phase, the applying it again uh, could probably be much less. Thanks, Jim. And here's a question from uh, Louise Platt. And uh, Louise asked that in, in the context of Alzheimer's disease research and also in consideration of recent FDA guidance on early AD research, what are your thoughts on how cognitive endpoints such as CAMTAP tests could be modeled? Do you have any uh, insight into that or 
<laughs> I've worked with those endpoints in the phase two space, uh, but not with biomarker, and, and I'm not aware of biomarker relationships to those phase two endpoints. So if you are, um, you could consider applying uh, this kind of stuff to that if you're aware of, of information that relates biomarkers to those cognitive endpoints, but I'm not aware of uh, such relationships. And my experience in, in that field is limited um, to just phase two endpoints. And Jim, I, I hope I pronounced this correctly, Yi Ji Zhao um, asked to, if you could explain a little bit about how the biomarker dose ranging info is used for the clinical endpoint dose ranging study. Um, via that linear model, um, we, we, um, we have this prior linear model, um, I mean, we have this model, so we, we get the earlier, the posterior predicted means for each dose um, from, from the phase uh, 1B information, and we use the assumed true linear model to get a predicted um, response before we run the phase 2B trial, and we use that to pick the doses for phase 2B. But when we simulate the phase 2B data, um, then the biomarker information goes away, and we get the phase 2B results with the clinical endpoint. So that's what's used to pick the dose. The biomarker information is used to pick the doses for phase 2B via the, the relationship. And the coefficients have to come from prior data that uh, relate the biomarker to the clinical endpoint. So this can only be used when you have prior information from either published literature or, or studies conducted in this disease with drugs of other, maybe other mechanisms and so forth. But, but you have to have the information to posit such relationships. Thanks, Jim. Um, a Yu Wang asks if uh, you can elaborate some on the insights and thoughts regarding how to build the model for relationship between biomarker and clinical response. Okay. Yeah, in this case, right. in this case, it was scatter plots. We had week four information and week twelve, week four information on biomarkers and week twelve information on clinical response. From a scatter plot, we tried to fit models, but it would only, you know, we only had enough precision to, to suggest a linear model. Um, more information might yield better model fits, but linear looked reasonable enough. Uh, and so we used a, 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 a linear relationship. But it started with a scatter plot and the usual type of modeling uh, technique that you'd go through using paired prior data. And Jim, uh, Helmo Scheer asked, uh, first make the observation that uh, not all biomarkers are equal. Um, if one had the option of multiple biomarkers, would weighing the different biomarkers separately move the program ahead to a clinical proof of efficacy for safety studies? Uh, the answer is probably yes, if they're positively correlated. Um, we we didn't do that. We had, uh, for this particular case, had go no go criteria defined based on the separate biomarker information at the early design space. Um, you probably could combine the two if you had clinical rationale to do that. Um, and improve the precision of the phase one trial in, in getting that proof of concept earlier. So, so I, I would expect, yes, we didn't do that or consider it. And Jim, that, that leads us to a question we, we often hear again, you know, are there therapeutic areas that uh, this particular approach is, is well suited to? 
uh, combining simulations with biomarkers and, for that matter, other areas that it may not be well suited to. Um, uh, yes, first of all, you have to have prior information that relates biomarker to the clinical response. Uh, I know there's a lot of work ongoing to develop biomarkers, and in some areas they exist. Uh, you know, in oncology, um, tumor response is often linked with clinical outcome response. Uh, in, in pain, uh, chronic pain, early pain response is often linked with late pain response. Uh, in obesity, early weight loss response, and there might be mechanistic responses that are tied to weight loss. So um, the key is uh, if statisticians working in their own therapeutic areas uh, know wh whether the biomarkers are related to clinical response or not, but, but you need that. Um, and, and so, you know, those are just a couple of examples. Could you see um, areas that where it's that, not? Where it's not or? Alzheimer's, probably. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I don't know if good biomarkers with Alzheimer's, and, you know, since Alzheimer's has limited approved therapies, you know, it's difficult to. Uh, establish a relationship of a biomarker to a response without a, uh, a highly effective therapy. So that's probably a very difficult area. But we see a lot of work in oncology with, with biomarkers. Yeah. Um, I know that you, but the biomarker response in oncology is, is more of the baseline biomarker to establish a subpopulation that will respond better. Um, as far as early response to a drug uh, to indicate uh, late response, uh, that might be less uh, applicable. But, um, you know, tumor response is one that is often used, and, and that might be worth considering. And uh, Jim, thanks. But they also, uh, Wen Yong, um, Hu, hope I'm pronouncing the name correctly. Yeah. First of all, thank you for a wonderful presentation. Uh, and asked, is, is the conclusion that the biomarker simulation is not used to, to the dose finding specific to your drug development pro program, the Merck program? Um, this methodology may or may, may or I think it may not apply to other drug development programs. Well, I think the methodology that we use is applicable in any case where there is a biomarker relationship to a clinical endpoint. Um, the conclusion that the dose-finding biomarker trial was not applicable is only particular to this particular project that we did the work on. So it's only one particular therapeutic situation. Um, it would need to be expanded to other potential relationships to answer that question. We had that question in our mind, uh, and we did some simulations that increased the degree of correlation of the biomarker to the clinical response. And in this case, that even if we had a biomarker that was highly correlated to the clinical response, it didn't materially improve the probability of getting the phase three dose right. But we think that's because the variability in the phase two trial is so large in relation to the response we're looking at. Um, and we only had a linear relationship. If we had a better mechanistic model relationship, then that might overcome that, uh, the variability in, in the phase two design. Uh, furthermore, uh, we didn't use a multivariate model that incorporated the phase two B result. 
to analyze all the data together. It, it could be that that might improve things. Um, but um, for the purpose of selecting a phase three dose, um, it, it would be hard to do that without having done it. It can be hard to do that the first time. And so uh, uh, when the sponsor embarks in a phase three program, they're probably only going to look at the clinical endpoint response. Um, uh, but 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 that's it, it, there's some wiggle there's some room for improvement there that hasn't been addressed yet because this is only the first step in, in those sorts of, of uh, uh, applications. Yeah. Detectium, are you aware of uh, instances where this technique or a similar approach has, has been utilized outside of the, this Merck project? No, as I mentioned at the beginning, we're aware of. Uh, simulating sequences of trials uh, in the late phase space, but not in the early phase space. So if anybody on the line knows about that, um, we'd appreciate an email. I think my email address is uh, on, on one of these slides. So, whoops. So, so you could uh, let, it, let me know. Because we'd really like to, to learn about that if, if, if it exists. And Jim, a uh, Todd Grosch uh, asks, uh, where did the prior information come from, assuming the Emacs model and the assumptions on the parameter estimates? Um, yeah. Uh, we had information from another drug in the class in which those Emax models were applicable. So we assumed that they were applicable for the candidate drug development program for which this was being done. Um, so that's another factor that if you're in an area where, a therapeutic area where there is no drug already approved and information available, uh, then, you know, you have no you would have to posit relationships, and uh, you wouldn't have any re any substantial information to believe that they were re they were applicable. Um, in this case, we had that because um, this is this program was not a, a, a first drug in a, in a therapeutic area. Uh, Yi Ji Zhao has a follow-up question to um, their their earlier question. Um, so if, if one is to skip the biomarker dose ranging study, how would the doses be determined in the clinical endpoint dose ranging study? Um, they, they, in this case, they were chosen, there was a maximum dose that was feasible um, based on safety and um, formulation. And then when we went with the rapid to 2B, Option, we use that maximum dose, a half the maximum dose, and a quarter of the maximum dose. And those were the three doses in the phase 2B trial. And then we fit the EMAX model based on that. And Jim, you Lau asked uh, in the example that uh, you presented today, uh, your simulation concluded that the phase 1B dose binding study for a low mid dose. That, that trial was really not a useful trial. Uh, is, was that because the biomarker is not a predictor of the clinical primary endpoint? No, it's more about that relationship that was existing was not sufficient to overcome the variability in the phase 2B response. Now, it could be that, that the other assumption that was made was that the ED50 was the same for the biomarker and the clinical endpoint. And also that in the rapid to 2B case, the maximum feasible dose and a half and a quarter was good enough to fit the model. And so, you know, we didn't learn anything more for, for that case. If those doses were off from the 
target. In other words, if the target dose was much lower, and much, then then that biomarker information might have been informative. So again, um, this is applicable to one specific therapeutic area and one specific configuration of those response curves. It hasn't been studied outside of that narrow space. So, you know, that's why the conclusion that it has to be applied in, in, in for each case because uh, it just hasn't been studied over a wide set of cases. Jim, Yu Lao uh, asks, um, speaking generally, does the FDA want to have low, mid, and high dose response curve to build the EMAX model? Uh, the person is wondering, uh, without the mid-low doses trial, what will be the suggestion method to build the dose response curve to support the dose selection for phase three? Um, I think uh, that depends on the therapeutic area. Um, if there's a therapeutic area where drugs have come before the drug, then FDA is going to look likely look for uh, dose response information to justify that you have the lowest dose that yields a minimum clinically important response. Um, however, if it's an area where there's no existing therapy or there's, it's a life-threatening situation, uh, then maybe the maximum tolerated dose um, without those selection information um, might be acceptable. So uh, I think that's on a case-by-case -case basis. Thanks, Jim. Uh, we're just about at the uh, top of the hour, and before uh, Jim addresses the last question, um, I just want to, again, thank everyone on behalf of Cytel and, and Jim for joining us today, and uh, again, ask you to take the survey when we conclude. And know that, again, the slides are available right now from slidesell.com homepage, and the today's webinar replay should be ready by no later than Thursday. Again, follow the links from slidesell.com on the homepage. Um, Jim, I'll let you address this question directly does, from, does the software, Gary. from Gary Meyer. Yeah, does the software describe cure allow for estimation of, is that TI or TL? Uh, in addition to target efficacy to further refine dose selection. Um, I got to know what PI or PL is, uh, and that doesn't register. Well, that's why I gave you the question. <laughs> well, maybe you could speak a little bit about the software um, that was that we utilized. Yeah, and Jared, feel free to email me afterwards to clarify. I'm happy to address that. Um, the, the, the software available here exists um, within Cytel and, and could be applied to other programs. Uh, yeah, we, we would be happy to do that. All right, then. I want to thank everyone again uh, for joining us today. Uh, some excellent questions, and most of all, uh, Jim, and we wish everyone uh, a very good day, and we look forward to you're joining us again. Uh, for those people who are um, interested in and certainly users of our e-software um, would like to uh, join a presentation next week uh, with our president and co-founder, Cyrus Meta, and Cyrus will be demonstrating uh, some of the new capabilities of EAST, including methodologies for um, adaptive trial design um, in pivotal trials confirmatory trials, and you simply can uh, register for this complimentary webinar by, again, going to the SciTel.com homepage. Um, the, there will be two webinars that SciTel will give um, next Tuesday, the 23rd, and Thursday, um, the 25th. Uh, just choose uh, the convenient time for you. Um, they will be repeated webinars, um, simple, that both, of course, will be live. And again, Cyrus, like Jim did today, will take your questions as time allows. So again, thank you very much for joining us here at Cytel, and we wish you a very good day.